Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India first lecture I introduced uh, what is IR very broadly. Um, in the second lecture we have looked at theories of IR again uh, just to give a general idea of what are the number of theories and how each one of them is distinct. In the third uh, lecture I have looked at realism and in the fourth lecture we are going to start looking at a relatively late entrant in IR theory and that is of feminism. So I am going to start off looking at feminism by three uh, interventions and each of them will highlight uh, the role of gender in conceptualizing IR and also thinking through uh, everyday issues and the uh, dynamics between men and women and the gendered uh, power between them. Now each of these is uh, needs to be uh, broken up and uh, unpacked so to speak and we will be doing that in the course of the lecture but first the three interventions. Intervention number one is uh, Kamila Shamsi is a Pakistani writer, a woman writer and she recently published a novel called Home Fire. Um, Home Fire was is a reworking of a Greek play by Sophocles called Antigone. Now why is that so important and why is that pressing to this moment is because of the plot of the play and the manner in which women are depicted and the questions on war, the state and belonging. Uh, so Focus plays Antigone looks at a woman whose name is Antigone. Uh, her brother has been killed in a war where he was contesting for the throne. The new king whose name is Crites uh, decides that as her, her brother was waging a battle against the state and that is an act of treason, it is a crime against the state, uh, he should not be allowed a burial, a decent burial on, uh, in the state, instead his, uh, his body should not be allowed to come home and therefore the term homecoming and home fire. So the whole idea of home and beyond, uh, Rabindranath Tagore talks about it in Gaire Baire, what's inside the home and what's beyond the home, inside and outside and each of these terms are crucial when one looks at the role of women, their participation uh, and their questioning in the tradition of international relations. Now this story is very interesting because Antigone is uh, his sister, the slain man's sister and she appeals to the king to allow her to allow her to bury him with full dignity because she loves her brother. She plays a devoted sister who upholds her brother's uh, suffering and his death in the battlefield. But it also puts into relief the whole question of who belongs to a state and who doesn't. And the fact that this play focuses on the aftermath of a war is also very interesting. Kamala Shamsi's book Home Fire is a lovely novel which also looks at the international intersections of UK as, a, as the home to millions of Muslims, as a Pakistan as an Islamic state and three siblings rather, two sisters and their brother and their contextualization of this play in the 21st century. Again this is important because it highlights the nature in which the international, the state, the citizen and the individual are all looped in together in this uh, beautiful play and it underlies as to how the international and the national come together frequently far more than what we would like it, like to believe. So that is the first intersection which highlights as to how uh, women throughout history in plays whether scripted, whether visible or invisibly have questioned the narrative of the state, 
the norms of the state and whether love comes before the love of a brother should be preceded or followed by the diktat of a state is the crucial question over here. Now the second uh, intervention which highlights again a, uh, the eject the um, the role of women in the global economy is, are the large number of Filipino maids employed in white upper middle class homes in America. Uh, we know that uh, domestic labor is uh, is the work done at home. Uh, it has multiple um, um, there are multiple things to be done within a home. Uh, so housekeeping itself is a wide domain. And in America, one finds that uh, the majority of women working as maids are Filipinos, Hispanics. Uh, one would largely categorize them as uh, immigrant, lowly paid uh, women who are working uh, in uh, these homes. Now, when one looks at these women, one wonders uh, why is this being discussed in a class of international relations. But the but the point that I'm trying to make over here is that the employment of women in jobs which are constrained to the home where they're not being paid uh, as much as you would get in a regularized job, the fact that this task is unregulated and gendered points to the enmeshing and the imbrication of women and men in an unequal global structure where frequently women find themselves doing work which is lowly paid or not paid at all. So the idea that immigrant workers uh, are working in, uh, in the homes, in American homes, wealthy homes, points to a global flow of workers who are moving from the Philippines or from Mexico to these homes looking for better paid work. Uh, but also points to the hierarchy between America or uh, Mexico and Philippines, which is of course a uh, international uh, sovereign matter, but is reflected within a home. So again, to uh, return to Rabindranath Tagore's uh, reference to gaire baire, things within the home, things beyond the house, we often think that the home is a boundary. But we often, but when we look at international relations, we also see that the outside is very much on our beds, uh, on our dining tables, in our kitchens. And uh, lowly paid immigrant workers is a classic example of how there's a international flow of uh, workers uh, where you find that there is a brain drain of educated uh, elite uh, people from developing countries to the developed. So in a recent study by Devesh Kapoor, it was found that uh, Indian immigrants in America are the most qualified because for three generations, the people migrating, the Indians migrating to America have been pedigreed, um, uh, degreed individuals. And on the other hand, you also have this gendered migration of poor women looking for better opportunities. So again, there's an interplay of women and men, uh, and we see the uh, the complexity of the matter even more sharply when we consider the third extremely sexualized uh, domain of surrogacy. Surrogacy can be dis defined as the practice of bearing a child uh, biologically for another parent. I'm not talk I'm not saying whether father or mother, uh, and in India. Uh, till this year, uh, commercial surrogacy was uh, legal under which same-sex couples, um, queer couples could uh, come to India and have, bear the possibility of having a surrogate child born by, again, a woman who would possibly not be uh, very, uh, not a middle class woman certainly, but a lowly paid uh, worker using her reproductive labor and producing a child over which she would have no claim. Commercial surrogacy was banned, uh, has been prohibited by the recent act, which ends it, but it does open up the possibility, it's still, uh, the possibility remains of looking at intersections between men and women 
on a global scale with a, within the home, beyond the home, where women are uh, performing acts, tasks as women, but also as uh, not as actors as much as uh, uh, people who have been told or uh, been entrusted a certain task on account. So housekeeping and surrogacy, there is certainly a link between them and both of them uh, draw upon the idealistic notions of what a woman is, whether it is her womb or whether it is her ability to uh, do housework. So we come to the tricky, uh, prickly question that we've been evading so far, and that is the question of patriarchy. Patriarchy is that institution where men have a control, right, authority over women's bodies, rights, lives. And for a long time in international relations, the word patriarchy was missing uh, in dialogue, in references, in uh, class discussions and this silence was broken in the 1980s uh, by a series of uh, brilliant books written by uh, white uh, western uh, women academics and when I categorize them as such I am not of course raising any objections or questions on their scholarship but only to outline and to remind ourselves that IR has traditionally been a Western discipline and that Westernness has only been questioned in the last 10 years by categorizing it as non-Western uh, uh, international relations. And we looked at it briefly in the second lecture, but the basic idea over here is that IR, there are multiple ways of looking at it. And therefore, when we look at the word theory, uh, which is a Greek word which fundamentally means seeing. Uh, how does one see and therefore theory is a way of seeing. In the 1980s, uh, feminism emerged or rather broke through uh, by, and we'll be looking at three scholars um, who questioned the, mas the inherent masculinity within IR. Uh, and how did this happen? We'll look at the, cert the context of the 1970s and the 1980s to see what was the ground upon which this uh, uh, women um, feminist writers broke through and uh, pretty much questioned the masculinist assumptions of IR. But a little bit about the 1970s, uh, we know that, uh, that realism has been the most influential theory uh, it has, uh, whether it is uh, Hans Morgenthau writing in the 1940s or whether it's Kenneth Waltz writing in uh, 1979, realism has played an influential role. It has been the axis, it has been the pivot around which other theories have revolved uh, for several reasons. Uh, the first reason, of course, is the fact that it is, to use uh, Waltz's word, parsimonious. It is elegant, it explains everything, it is uh, clinical, it is categorical, it does away with uh, many dilemmas which perhaps the pacifists had. So realism doesn't have an agenda to change the world because it accepts the world the way it is and that is what Robert Cox, uh, influential IR theorist pointed out that when you theorize you either want to explain the world or you want to change it. When you want to explain the world, it becomes easier. For instance, patriarchy can also be easily explained away, but it is harder to challenge it. So, until the 1960s and 1970s, dualism was uh, the pivotal uh, theory. Um, then came neorealism, which I just mentioned as uh, Kenneth Waltz's theory of uh, looking at the structure wherein anarchy as a defining feature of the structure made war uh, inescapable. It made it a feature of uh, the system. So fundamentally, uh, like several classic war theorists, Kenneth Waltz's theory of neuralism accepts anarchy, explains anarchy, beautifies anarchy and also in a very sly way justifies the existence of war, which means that violence and war are a part of uh, international relations. 
at the same time they also realists also glorify and valorize rationality so states are often upheld as rational uh, policy makers uh, the international world is structured to be one of war calculation strategy whether it's sun tzu whether it is kautilya whether it is waltz whether it's morgantho the world of war is a masculine war of no ethical dilemmas where war is accepted as a feature of the structure and interestingly enough in the 1970s there are questions raised about this so this is a period where there is there are questions by critical theorists you have richard davitt you have um, uh alexander went comes slightly later or uh, you have neo uh, the neo liberal debate with kyohen and nai but these are men talking amongst themselves largely about abstract rationalized structures now these two words are questioned by feminist theorists in the 1980s and we're looking at a uh, three of them so by the late 1980s uh, there were at least three uh, major into feminist interventions in a world which had been inhabited by male theorists uh, so far and these were uh, john bethke elston's work war and women in 1987 uh, cynthia enlow's work in 1989 and of course the formative and combative or uh, antiknos a uh, conversation with realists so these three scholars in the late 19 or uh, 80s and um, uh, during this the fag end of the uh, 20th century raised a few bold questions and outlined as to how ir had been fundamentally uh, been overlooking a major aspect of the international now from that time onwards feminism has now moved not to being a marginalized ir theory to being a formidable one and part of that reason is because uh, re re both realism neo realism liberalism neo liberalism have found themselves at the shorter end of the stick uh with several areas within ir which neither which none of these theories either anticipated or have the capability to theorize upon and what i'm referring to is the end of the soviet union in uh, 1989 and the coming of the the uh, uh the end of the ussr um the emergence of ethnic conflict um in east europe uh uh ethnic cleansing and several areas which challenged the nation state which challenged the state which challenged the underpinning of these theories which was essentially the state so in many ways feminism has made its inroads uh, not only because of the incapacity of these theories to examine to accommodate a phenomena which it was not equipped to deal with but also because uh, ir itself has expanded far beyond uh, looking at the state as the primary unit which uh, classical realism and neo realism does uh, liberalism certainly does and neo liberalism accepts institutions within within its an analytical fold but none of them deal with the harsh brutality of war now that is a question which uh estein and enlo picked up in their late uh in their books which emerged during this period and this question is famously framed uh by enlo when she says where are the women now this question shook uh the uh structure of the way ir had been imagined because in its imagination its theorization there had been no women so even when you look at war 
uh, the justification of war, the violence in a war, uh, A, war was accepted as an intrinsic part of international relations and B, uh, suffering emotional issues to do with war, uh, bloody battlefields did not arise and therefore Edlow's question where are the women is of terrific importance because it challenges the crucial aspect of realist assumptions that is war and uh, the state and um, uh, let's not forget that Kenneth Wall's formulations also focused primarily on man. So when he talks about man, state and system, he is unconsciously using man as humankind. But of course, uh, feminist theory, if you look at the background, the context to it, within political theory, radical theory had made forays in the 1970s. But IR had still, was still close to the... Uh, feminist theorists who existed outside IR. So in short, in the, uh, during this period, feminist theorists, very few in number but extremely loud, sought to visibilize women. Now this was a very interesting project to take upon because it, mean, it meant looping women into uh, IR, the study of IR, even though they existed but they sought to visibilize the invisible and that is why uh, feminist theories, are, uh, feminist theory uh, has been a remarkable intervention for bringing in those who have been visible but are not routinely seen. So let's start with uh, Enlo's book, um, uh, ban uh, Bananas, uh, Beaches and Bases. Uh, Enlo is a terrific writer, she writes uh, powerfully, but fundamentally in these three areas, bananas, beaches and bases, she is looking at three sites where there is an intersection of the international, but we overlook the international. So bananas as a form of colonial cultivation, uh, beaches, which is uh, tourism, uh, beaches are the epitome of uh, touristic enjoyment which are frequented by, um, by men who have money to travel and also come looking for sexual pleasure. So one thinks of Thailand and other places known uh, infamous rather for offerings um, uh, sex tourism and of course we can also look at uh, commercial surrogacy in the same breath of using a woman's uh, reproductive uh, body for uh, a certain material gain and uh, finally bases. Uh, Enlo looks at military bases and she looks at as to how prostitution and sex work has often been the uh, unspoken chapters of um, uh, American naval bases. Now these three uh, sites are very interesting because Enlo is also mimicking her male counterparts, which is she's looking at the international, she's an American, so she's looking at uh, the, uh, uh, the international beyond the national boundaries of America and all of these are somewhere which are beyond. But in her work, she also looks at Filipino maids, which we started off by uh, discussing uh, in this class as to how women are present but are rendered invisible. They are part of the global economic sexual uh, structure, but they're often rendered invisible. So the part uh, Enlo's task was to visibilize them. And uh, in Elstein's book, War and Women, Elstein pushes it to another level when she looks at women in the battlefield. Uh, writing behind the scenes, whether it is Klaus White's wife, Mrs. Claude's wife, as she refers her to, who was entrusted with the publication of his uh, celebrated uh, war classic uh, called On War. Uh, whether it is uh, the women in Homer's Iliad, whether it is uh, women in Greek uh, plays and battles. Uh, Elstein's book, War and Women, looks at 
women who are engaged in war in multiple ways but have been rendered invisible. So both these books were enormously influential and at the same time the doors of mainstream IR shut them out. So in Keohin's uh, books or classic theorist books, feminism was still seen as a contender. Uh, it was still seen as a contender and not a rival. So the crucial uh, rivalry was between neorealism and uh, neoliberalism. And of course, you had Wallerstein with his uh, Marxist uh, theory. You had critical theory. Uh, but fundamentally, liberal, uh, feminism was denied that validation of being a rival theory to IR theorists. Till, of course, uh, J. Ann Tickner. Uh, published her book, a classical uh, book on feminist IR where she directly took on Morgenthau by questioning his six principles of realism. And this book is often seen as a classic textbook of feminist IR theory and of course indeed it is where Enlo and Elstein uh, drew a wide map in uh, bringing in the narrative on women. Tickner's book is uh, clean, it's incisive, it is to the point and it is also brutal in questioning uh, male assumptions, uh, normalizing males, male assumptions and pointing out um, uh, what the feminist point of view is. And Tickner's career in that uh, respect has been remarkable for her sustained efforts in bringing in feminism as a contender to uh, IR theory. So since then, IR has, uh, feminism has made a serious inroad. It is considered to be, with feminist me methodology, it is considered a rival to mainstream theories. And now we will look at Anne Tickner's formulation where she takes on Morgenthau's six principles of realism and formulates the feminist uh, response. And uh, this conversation was uh, came to a, st a standoff uh, when Tickner wrote her article uh, in 1996. Uh, uh, you just don't understand. It was an article published in Millennium Journal of International Studies where she outlined that men, uh, feminist theorists and their contenders are talking past each other. The conversation isn't actually a conversation at all is what uh, Tickner was trying to argue uh, in this article. But we will look at uh, her six principles uh, in the next section. Now the reason why we are focusing on uh, Tickner's reformulation of Morgenthau's six principles is primarily because uh, it's important to understand what Tickner and her compatriots were arguing. Uh, Tickner and her compatriots were fundamentally trying to rescue uh, women from the androcentric perspective that men had molded them into as sacrificing mothers, as loving sisters, as dutiful daughters, as passive upholders of peace. They were doing quite just the opposite. Uh, in a study conducted by Enlo, uh, she drew the world's attention to the fact that nearly 80% of clerical work at the United Nations and other bureau international bureaucratic structures was indeed being done by women. Uh, within foreign policy in the White House, and because we're talking about Americans here, uh, a lot of the staff were indeed women who were typing letters, uh, making drafts, uh, uh, possibly uh, editing speeches. But nonetheless, they were not in the forefront of uh, power. And finally, the wives of diplomats. Uh, diplomats' wives were frequently part of um, missions. They were part of the international structure of diplomacy. They played a key role in hosting, uh, advising. But all of this was seen as something which was of no consequence. And 
that's exactly what Ann Tickner was trying to draw the attention to IR scholarship to that women existed the world of men dependent upon these minions and yet they went unrecognized so what they were trying to do was to outline the valuable role uh, of women in international politics as realists as practitioners of uh, power but at the same time as women who were constantly as players who were unrecognized and constantly marginalized and again uh, we return to the example of Clausewitz uh, the Prussian military strategist whose book on uh, war is celebrated as a classic realist text and yet the role of his wife in the crafting of the text is something which is not spoken about till uh, Elstein uh, excavates it. What these women were trying to do was to relook at war, relook at history and inject women's experiences within them and therefore when we look at uh, Christine Sylvester's book, there is a large degree of women's experiences injected into that for the singular purpose of validating women's experiences as equal as the androcentric view of the world. Now, a major reason uh, why women often settled for positions of power which were behind the scene or which were not in the forefront uh, this was also a period where you had uh, women heads of state. You had Golda Meir in Israel, Indira Gandhi in uh, uh, India, Margaret Thatcher in Great Britain. Uh, as practitioners of um, realpolitik, they were heads of government framing policy. Uh, uh, the Falklands War took place under the regime of Margaret Thatcher. And yet at the same time, there was a reluctance to accept either women visible in political power or as those who are upholding the international structure in their roles as minions as from uh, sex workers to diplomatic to the wives of diplomats to staff at international organizations. Uh, the campaign was to bring to the forefront that women were not passive, they were active. And at the same time, they played a valuable role in international politics. Now, when uh, data was produced about the number of women employed either by the White House or government organizations, a uh, work by Carol Pateman called The Sexual Contract uh, was used to end used to uh, have draw insights into the structural relationship of power between men and women. Now, the name of pa uh, Pateman's book, The Sexual Contract, is uh, refers to the theorists in the 17th, 16th and 17th century called the social contractualists. Uh, these would be John Locke, uh, Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And uh, these theorists looked at the state as a, a creature under contract with the individual. Locke and Hobbes were English philosophers and they looked at the citizen and the state as enmeshed in a contract of rights and obligations and so did Rousseau, who was a French philosopher. But the idea that I'm circling upon here is the notion that there was a pact of equality between the state and citizens. Now, over here, citizens meant men. And in Hobbes and these three philosophers' uh, uh, expositions, the assumption that they made was that it is men who are drawing the contract and dealing with the state and securing their rights and certainly property rights and voting rights so essential to the making of a polity were not granted to women till the early 20th century to the early 19th century 
1894 in New Zealand is the first state which grants women the right to vote. So, Carol Pateman points out to the social contract as a contract between men and the state and she draws our attention to the invisible contract already made between men and women and by that and that is what she calls the sexual contract and the sexual contract is that contract under which women hand over their bodies, their labor to men and in exchange are granted protection. Now the term sexual contract covers a wide range of tasks done by women. So be it editing, uh, typing, a large number of women uh, were employed as typists in the early 20th century uh, or domestic work which is largely unpaid, uh, making a cup of tea, making the bed, uh, preparing a meal or child rearing, again to do with emotional work, nurturing and finally the sexual contract itself which is the right of a man over a woman's body for his sexual pleasure was the contract that Pateman was looking at. Now how does one connect Pateman with Tickner and other IR theorists is by trying to understand as to why women were part of power structures but they were not claiming them. They were invisible but they were not staking, laying or claiming a stake to power was highlighted by Pateman's argument whereby she fundamentally argued that power means different things to men and different things to women. Power means cooperation to women whereby they were guaranteed uh, protection uh, from being violated by other men uh, and this in turn turned into a form of subservience and stepping back where men stepped forward. So very succinctly, a feminist IR does three things. It tries to visibilize women which it has done successfully in multiple tasks from the home, from the housewife, uh, again a very peculiar term. Uh, to the uh, sex worker, to the uh, diplomat's wife, women are part of uh, an amazing amount of work which is very frequently underpaid and does not uh, have access to power. The second thing that they were trying to outline was that IR has been androcentric which means that it has been men's experiences which has been upheld as a universal experience. So a man's view of war is often positioned as the view of war whereas the same point of view can have the same uh, object can have multiple ways of looking at it. And the third was that women are not passive but very active but uh, frequently not counted as crucial uh, political players. Now it is in the language of masculinist uh, IR that Tickner takes on and before getting to this crucial aspect uh, we must not forget that there were other uh, key figures in uh, social sciences and academia in IR for instance Susan Strange is a giantess as Christine Sylvester calls her of IR. Uh, she did terrific and tremendous work in the uh, domain of international political economy but she was not a feminist and you have other writers who were women who were not feminist. So the before moving on it must be clear that women had been writing uh, uh, intervening in academics but not with this gendered perspective of the world. So the gendered perspective of the world sees the world as divided between men and women where women have the uh, different experience uh, of certain words. So let's just look at how realists and feminists disagree on fundamental points 
and we will start with the first uh, word which is very dear to realists and that is of objectivity. Uh, objectivity is often upheld as a standpoint which is uh, visible to everybody. It is a decision, uh, it is based on a decision which is clear to everybody. There is, it assumes that there is a truth which is accessible to everybody in the same way. So an objective truth is final, there is an air of finality to it. Uh, and it is here that Antikna questions objectivity by, re by bringing the alternative of subjectivity, that the truth can be viewed in multiple ways and there are more than one ways of looking at it and many ways they were practicing it as well. They were practicing uh, this in workshops, in uh, discussion forums, in uh, uh, round table conferences as to how to inject women's experiences whereas the, where the androcentric experience is not the only uh, experience of that. So the first word that they questioned was objectivity and uh, challenge the possibility of objectivity and their uh, alternative for that was of course subjectivity, number one. Number two, the definition of power. Now for Morgenthau and other androcentric definitions of power, power is domination of one over another where the other has to submit and the person who is dominating conquers. It is a colonial understanding of power, it is a hierarchical understanding of power, it is a, a structured understanding of power where power means the power of one over another. There is a loss of agency, there is a sense of violation, there is a, a hierarchical dynamical interplay in this understanding of power. So when a state conquers another uh, and when a man rapes a woman, it is a form of that understanding of brutal violence. Uh, Tickner positioned that power can be understood also in forms of cooperation. Power is not combative, it is also cooperative and she outlined as to how women cooperate with men under the strains of patriarchy of course towards a common end where the loss of my power need not mean the empowerment of another person over me. It is not a top down approach but it is a collective empowerment. So even while she argued that cooperation rather than conflict is a form of power. Tikna also cautioned that women must not be upheld as peacemakers. Very often uh, men entrust this responsibility on women as peace lovers, as uh, anti-war uh, participants, uh, as people who are not in favour of violence. So Anne Tikna cautions against that that uh, kind of stereotyping of women but she does point out that power could have multiple, uh, there are multiple ways of working and an organization for instance is a classic example of collective empowerment where people work together towards a common objective rather than uh, trampling on each other and uh, compelling each other to uh, surrender in order to achieve their goods. So the first one is objectivity, the second one is power, we come to the third one and that is autonomy. Uh, Morgenthau clearly uh, lists autonomy as that premium value where the politician, the lawyer, the economist have the ability to make decisions in dissection from the rest of society. So when Morgenthau talks about autonomy, what he means is the agency and what we mean by agency in social science is the absolute free will, unencumbered, uninterrupted, unquestioned uh, ability of a statesman for instance to make a decision is autonomous whereby he is not seen as somebody who is connected to society. Tikna questions that, she says that autonomy itself is a myth 
and again to uh, go back to the theme that we've been looking at that men depend upon women's labor in order to further their projects but they frequent very fr uh, rarely recognize that uh, Tikna argues that autonomy is again androcentric it is the male way of looking at the world so the man who steps out uh, to spend the day at work has been supported by a woman who has uh, cleaned and prepared his food or clothes or enabled him but that enabling has not been recognized instead it is celebrated as autonomy so Tikna questions that autonomy and uh, argues that men and women are enmeshed very much their labors and their uh, uh, there is a visible cooperation between men and women and autonomy of course has to be uh, questioned at uh, the celebrated agency of men has to be questioned we come to the fourth and the last point which uh, Morgantho upholds and that of course is rationality uh, men are rational women are emotional is a old way is a traditional conservative way of looking at uh, the differences between the male mind and the female mind and there was a classic text around this time which questioned uh, the manner in which even science is depicted as a male's as a man's world and nature is often seen as a mother nature somebody who's reckless unpredictable and needs to be uh, conquered in order for progress and development to take place so Tikna questions uh, the role of rationality and questions the masculinity attributed to it which at the same time she is arguing that women are not emotional, temperamental, uh, hysterical creatures but are part of that rational bureaucratic structure and of course again the data about women in uh, bureaucracies, women part of uh, huge structures but again at a clerical level, at a typist level, uh, always at the background and never in the forefront. So these four uh, areas of contestations uh, outlined as to what the feminist IR intervention was seeking to do and has successfully done uh, in the, um, the last uh, 30 years and from the time when Ann Tickner wrote her book uh, experiences of women um, the gender nature of war uh, emotive issues such as mercy apology uh, forgiving uh, suffering those words which make up our everyday lives have come to the forefront of uh, international relations and of course we look we end today's lecture by looking at uh, the several uh, f feminist scholars who since then have intervened and uh, played a role in furthering the uh, feminist widening of what we consider IR so as we draw uh, and enter this lecture uh, we must step back and evaluate uh, how far feminist theory has come and its shortcomings as well uh, so to refer to a writer who I've been referring to constantly during this lecture um, uh, Christine Sylvester uh, IR and feminism in many ways are two nations uh, trying to find a home uh, for each other uh, in each other and in many ways there is a recognition that globally uh, women have been denied uh, rights and uh, uh, luxuries which have been granted to men so the question then arises how does one view uh, the forays of feminist IR theory uh, let us not forget that uh, the scholars who were making these inroads as brave and as empowered as they were were uh, white uh, western women academics which doesn't take away from their credibility or scholarship but it also points to uh, the homogeneity of that group 
Now, since uh, Ann Tickner's work uh, made headways, um, several other feminist groups have uh, a critiqued the whiteness of that group, uh, critiqued the limitedness of that group, and also championed their own uh, feminisms. So it is uh, quite fair to say that third world feminists have often questioned uh, the theory of white western feminism and rightly so. And in this cacophony, in this pluralistic uh, way of looking at feminism, uh, it does not take away from the core of the argument which is that women uh, must strive to be to make themselves visible and of course one can see that whether it is a question of gender equality at the united nations uh, or uh, two recent uh, remarkable examples highlight the growing global recognition of states turning inwards uh, enlo looked at women out of America, uh, Anne Tickner is talking about uh, women globally, but it is becoming increasingly evident and important that states are pressurized to follow, frame policies which do not discriminate against women. Just two examples to highlight that in uh, 2018, Sweden uh, issued a feminist foreign policy manual which envisaged what a feminist foreign policy would look like, which again uh, underlines how the state itself has been committed to gender equality, uh, but more importantly as to how feminism is not just a domain of national policies, but must be reflected at the foreign policy as well. Uh, more recently, uh, the feminist uh, IR um, feminist writer Emma Watson uh, as part of the G7 Gender Equality Advisory Council has called for uh, a feminist foreign policy whereby states are pressurized, persuaded to frame feminist uh, policies where women do not face uh, a discrimination on the basis of gender. So whether it is uh, women in Saudi Arabia learning how to drive whether it is the right to wear a hijab or not wear it, uh, whether it is the right to take your life uh, under the custom of sati or whether it is a violative act. These are questions which point to everyday customs and the intersection between women, the state and the international. So feminist uh, IR theory is uh, essential to looking at not just the gendered relations between men and women, but it also throws out of balance the carefully curated structure of Kenneth Walls where he separated the structure from the system and from the state. Uh, feminist IR theory muddies that water it outlines the invisible linkages between women within a state, beyond the state, at the international structure, be it women as contesting for the, uh, to be the president of, the, of America, which was Hil Hillary Clinton in the previous uh, American presidential elections, or be it uh, campaigning for the rights of immigrant or women workers uh, in Western worlds. So the question is not an academic one, but it is a question of real lives and the impact that state policies can shape and frame in enacting uh, policies which allow for greater parity, equality uh, between uh, uh, the sexes. And uh, feminist theory certainly is part of those critical theories which have uh, revealed the masculinist uh, tendencies of realism. And it, has only, it is only the beginning of uh, unraveling um, the gendered structure of uh, uh, IR theory. So in the subsequent uh, lecture, we will be looking at critical theory, equally an important theory in unraveling 
hierarchies and inequalities of a different kind and I will see you in the next class.